Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Um, today is March 24th, 2021, and I just wanted to get on here and share some things that the Lord um, showed me over the last couple weeks, specifically on the 11th of March and the 12th. I think it was just those two days. Gosh. Yes, so it's been a little while, but to get it out now. Um, so let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time with you. Thank you so much for your word, for speaking to your people through your word, um, to the least of us. And please bless this time. Holy Spirit, just speak everything that you want to speak. Speak whatever you want through me and let nothing come out of my mouth that is not from you. I give you this time. Please just bless our hearts. Give us wisdom and understanding and discernment. I rebuke all agents of all principalities, all powers, all demonic forces, all evil spirits. You may not interfere with any part of this video. In Jesus' name, you are evicted. Get out. In Jesus' name. Father, just send your angels to guard all around uh, all this technology and this video and everyone watching and every word that I speak. Just shut my mouth if there's something I'm not supposed to say and open it when you want me to speak. In Jesus' name, we thank you for these things. Amen. All right. So, a lot of people have been getting very discouraged, um, especially with what's happening in this country, and I've heard a lot of people say, well, God is angry with us, we're facing the wrath of God, and we didn't pray enough, we didn't humble ourselves enough, we've just been too rotten, too evil. Um, the Lord drew my attention to a few passages of scripture, and the first time he took me through them, it was in a prophetic way, and the second time was in his character and how he actually treats us, which is a lot different than I think most of us think, automatically think. Like if we really sit there and think about it, we might come to these conclusions, but just off the cuff, I think most of us feel like, at least I do, if I screw up in the slightest, that God's always there, like pointing a finger at me and ready to strike me down, and that's not how he is. Um, so yes, so... The first passage that the Lord showed me was um, in 1 Chronicles 20. And this also, the same situation is also recorded in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Um, and it's kind of, I don't want to say two sides of the coin, but you get one picture in one and you get another picture in the other of what's going on. So we're going to go to Chronicles first. So we're in Chronicles 20, and it happened in the spring of the year at the times, at the time the kings go out to battle, that Joab led out the armed forces and ravaged the country of the people of Ammon, and came and besieged Rabbah, but David stayed in Jerusalem. And Joab defeated Rabbah and overthrew it, and David took their king's crown from his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold. There were precious stones in it. And it was set on David's head. Also he brought out the spoil of the city in great abundance, and he brought out the people who were in it, and put them to work with saws, with iron picks, and with axes. So David, David did to all the cities of the people of Ammon. Then David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Now, this is important, and it points back to, to Samuel. Because in Samuel, you'll find the same scenario. However, this... So when the kings go out to war, when David sends Joab out to this particular battle, this is the one-year anniversary um, of, let's go back to Samuel, just so we're there. It's the one-year anniversary of the battle that was fought between um, David and um, the Ammonites because... The Ammonite king had died, and and his son, Hanun, reigned in his place. And David sent out a delegation of high officials to give him, him the, his condolences. And Hanun's people said, no, they're just spies. They're spying out the land. And so they humiliated these men. They shaved their beards off. They cut off their garments at the buttocks and sent them back. 
So they were greatly humiliated, and this made him a stench to David. So instead of apologizing and being humble, he hired the Assyrians to come and fight with him against David, and David wins this battle. So on the year anniversary, when the kings go out to war, which is in the springtime, the month of Nisan, which is actually right now, this year it started on March 13th, um, and it goes through Passover, over Passover, and on the other side. I don't remember what day it ends, but that's also kind of an important thing. Um, but during this battle, this is the battle where David stays home and sees Bathsheba bathing from the rooftop of his palace, and goes and sleeps with her, and then she gets pregnant, and he calls her husband back from the battle, and her husband refuses to go home and sleep with her because his buddies are all fighting in a war and he shouldn't be back at home enjoying himself with his wife. So he doesn't go home, he refuses to go home, so finally David gives up and sends him back to battle with instructions given to Joab to put him where the fighting is the worst so he can be killed. So David sleeps with another man's wife, has her husband murdered. All the while, this battle is going on. He suffers the consequence that the Lord gives him of that son dying. So Bathsheba gives birth to a son. They don't even name the son here. His name isn't even mentioned, but the Lord takes him up to himself. He, the son dies. And David fasts and weeps until his son dies. And then he's like, okay, this is the punishment from the Lord because um, the prophet Nathan had already come to him and told him this is what's going to happen. Called him out on his crap and said this is the consequence. And David tried to plead with God, but the consequence was the consequence. Mind you, this was going on and David still wins this war. His men still win this war. He still gets the victory over these people. And then following this in First Chronicles 20, uh, four. Now it happened afterward that war broke out at Gezer with the Philistines, at which time, I can't even pronounce his name. I'm going to mess all of these names up, but I'm going to try. Um, Sibachai, the Hushathite, killed Sippai, who was one of the sons of the giant, and they were subdued. Again, there was war with the Philistines, and Elhanan, the son of Jer, killed Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, and the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again, so a third time there was war and Gath, where there was a man with great stature, so another giant with 24 fingers and toes, six on each hand, six on each foot. And he was also born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shemiah, David's brother, killed him. These were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David, and by the hand of his servants. So, David has this crap going on with adultery and murder, but God still gives him the victory, and then gives him and the men with him, and those coming from his administration and his own bloodline, the victory over all of the giants. Not just Goliath, but all of them get destroyed by David and his family and his men. So God is still blessing him in the midst of all the garbage that's been going on in his life, while disciplining him for the sin that needed to be disciplined. Um, and then shortly after this, he does the census, and there's plague that breaks out against this people. And while all of this is going on, like in, in Samuel 11 and 12, between the time that he murders Uriah um, after he sleeps with Bathsheba and the time that Rabbah is captured, at least where it's recorded as captured here, it doesn't mean that those things happened in between this time. It doesn't mean Rabbah wasn't captured until after his son was born. But all of that is happening, and Ammon rapes Tamar. Ammon is a son of David. Tamar is Absalom's sister, um, and he, he falls in love with her and love. He falls in lust with her and rapes her and then is disgusted with her, sends her away. Absalom gets mad. He murders his brother, and then he flees and David won't go after him, so finally Joab is like, I have to trick you into going to get him. So finally Joab tricks him into letting Absalom come back. So Absalom comes back, and David wants to go see him, but he refuses because he did this thing, and he doesn't think it's right, even though David himself is a murderer, and it was a lot less justified than Absalom's. Not that murder is justified. Um, so Absalom finally 
gets David's attention, but then he tries to take over the kingdom and ends up actually moving into the palace as king. David goes into exile with the people that are loyal to him. So Absalom takes over, sleeps with his dad's con concubines, and then God brings David back. And Absalom is killed. Um, and David mourns for Absalom. Who it's in a way I wouldn't see. Anyways, David's life was a hot mess. He was not real great at, confront at confronting the problems in his own family. And he tried to cover up his adultery with murder and had all of these things going on, but God was still taking care of him and God was still blessing him. So despite all of the garbage, God was still picking him up and cleaning him off and blessing him because he was a man after God's own heart. So even with all of these things, he was still a man after God's own heart. God still loved him. God still knew who he was. He was still God's anointed. He never lost that anointing. His whole life, his whole time being king, he never lost the Lord's anointing. Saul did. Saul was not a man after God's own heart. Saul did not murder a woman's husband after sleeping with her and getting her pregnant. But he was not a man after God's own heart. He defied the Lord. He didn't trust the Lord. David trusted God, even through all of his faults. He was very imperfect, but he really loved the Lord. Um, so that's just one picture of how God deals with us. When our hearts truly love him, but we're still just screwing up, not that we should try to screw up, but he's not there trying to destroy us. He's there rooting for us and hoping we'll do the right thing. And he does have to step in and discipline us sometimes. Um, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes his grace and his mercy override any discipline we're going to get. Um, but he's still there on our side, rooting for us, hoping we'll make the right choice. And he doesn't give up. So there's that part of it. Um, but then I want to move on to Judges, or move back, I should say. Back to, and this is a place where the Lord has really had me a lot the last few months. Um, in Judges 20, and the Lord gave me this um, as a prophetic word about what America is going through. But first we're going to talk about the state of the Israelites. So what happens here is a horrible man... I'm a horrible man because he just treated his concubine horribly. Um, so she goes back to her father. She doesn't like him. So she goes back to her father. He goes to get her, convinces her to come back with him. And on their way back, they stop in a town in Benjamin. And while they're in that town, the men of the city come out and they want to rape him. So instead, he sends out his concubine so she can be raped all night. Great guy. And she is raped all night and abused all night and ends up dying on the doorstep. So he picks her up, takes her home, cuts her into 12 pieces, and sends these pieces of her body out to the nation of Israel. And they come out, and they're like, whoa, this has never happened before. Like, what is going on? And he tells them what happened. These men committed a lewd act, as if his act wasn't lewd. Um, and the nation of Israel decides to go to war with Benjamin. And they inquire of the Lord. So all of them go... The entire nation of Israel and they inquire of the Lord they went to so in verse 18 so this is Judges 20 18 then the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God they said which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin the Lord said so the Lord responds and he says Judah first so they go they go to battle with Benjamin Benjamin has 26,000 men Israel has like 400,000 men they go to battle against Benjamin, and Benjamin destroys them. Like, kills 22,000 of their guys. So they go home all upset, because um, they've just been defeated. And in verse 22, the people, that is the men of Israel, encouraged themselves again, formed the battle line in the place where they had put themselves in array on the battle on the first day. Then the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord. So now they weep before the Lord instead of just going and saying, hey, who should go first? They go weep before the Lord, saying, shall I again draw near for battle against the children 
of my brother Benjamin. And the Lord said, go up against him. So now they go out to battle again. And again, they lose 18,000 men. They are completely defeated by the Benjamites. So they go back, completely defeated, and they come to the house of God and they weep. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days, and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days. And they said, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? They're like, God, you told us to go out twice. Granted, he didn't say they would win. And we haven't won. Like, we've been defeated both times. And the Lord said, go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hand. So then they go up, they set an ambush, and um, while Benjamin thinks they're winning like they did the first two days, Israel is busy back here burning their city down, and they turn around and see it, and they freak out and realize that they've been had, and they are wiped out. At the end of it, there are 600 men left. And this goes on. I believe for four months. Yep, four months. Verse 47. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the Rock of Ramon, and they stayed at the Rock of Ramon for four months. And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword from every every city, men and beasts, all who were found. They also set fire to all the cities they came to. So they completely destroyed Benjamin. And then... In 21, they're remorseful because they don't want this tribe of their brother to be completely wiped out. Um, so they find them wives because all of them had vowed not to give them any wives from their, um, from their tribes. So they go and they kidnap wives. Great being a woman back then. Um, yes, so they kidnap wives and basically rebuild. Now, another interesting thing about this is later on we'll find, so this is before David, when David comes along, Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. And by the time David becomes king, nearly all of the tribe of Benjamin has moved over to David's side, even though Saul is their brother. Um, so that's an interesting little thing to note. So let's go back. So first, the crime. The crime was heinous. There were two crimes here. There was just the crime of being a jerk and sending out your wife to be raped all night. And the crime of the rape and the crime of wanting to sodomize this man to begin with. However, this was kind of a thing that had been going on for a while. Back in, in these days, in all of Judges, you just see this horrible behavior, just no faith, with little sprigs of faith here and there. Um, even some of the judges were just awful. Um, so the nation of Israel was not unaware of what was going on in Benjamin. They were just complacent. They just were like, eh, it's not affecting us. It's not right here in my backyard. So whatever, we just won't go over there. So they were aware of what was going on and they didn't do anything about it. They just sat by and were silent. So then they finally get upset and they go out all self-righteous as if they were so much better even though this own jerk who had his wife murdered at the hands of these people is from them. So they go out, they don't humble themselves, they don't repent for letting all of this crap slide. They just go out expecting to beat Benjamin because there are so many of them and so few of Benjamin and God said to go, so we're going. God didn't say he'd give them the victory. So they go and they lose the first time. So then, then they weep a little. And they're like, oh, we lost. But they're not weeping because they are repentant of their sins or are realizing that they need the Lord, that they really need to turn to him. They're weeping because they lost, because they got spanked. So God sends them out again, and again they lose. And then finally they get it. Finally they realize our hearts have not been good. We've been letting all of this garbage slide. And we need to really seek the Lord instead of just going out there saying we're better than them even though we've let all these things happen. So we really are no better than them. And then finally, when they finally get it, 
and their hearts are no longer in this place of oblivion, then the Lord gives them the victory. But he didn't allow them to be completely destroyed. I mean, there were 400,000 of them. More of them died than the men of Benjamin. But the Lord was just disciplining them, nudging them back towards him, towards having a right heart. He didn't wipe them out. He didn't send enemies in to wipe them out. Now, all throughout Judges, they're constantly being disciplined by their enemies. Um, But he didn't wipe them out. He just got them to the place where they needed to be. And yes, sometimes the Lord does that with us, and we'll think he's leading us somewhere, and I have to pay attention to this. Um... And then he'll just take it away because we weren't in the right place. Not that he's going to take it away forever. It's just a, ah, uh, not quite yet. You're not quite getting that victory yet because, yeah, you're not ready for that. Your heart is not in the right place. So we really need to check ourselves. I certainly need to check myself a lot. Um, so then the last place that I want to take you guys is Psalm 103. And this is a chapter of the Bible that the Lord gave me when I was 21, um, and I just had a a whole bunch of stuff crashing crashing down on me. I had gotten to a place in my life where things were going really well. I had met my husband, and just this dread came over me that I was going to be punished for every wrong thing that I had ever done and lose it all. And the Lord gave me this. And this is probably the most profound and the best picture of how he really handles us. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And he really did this for me. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us. In other words, he will not always punish us. He will, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He forgives us, and he tosses our transgressions from us, as far as they could be tossed, forever away, as far as the east is from the west. That means they never connect. It just keeps going. Like, it just keeps going. And he shows this to us in the story of David, that even though David screwed up, he transgressed, God removed that from him because his heart was for him. David's heart was for the Lord. So we need to remember that we don't have to be perfect. We still will be disciplined because God is a good father and good fathers discipline their children. But he loves us and he's not there to try to beat us down. And so it is with entire nations, with this country. He is not out to destroy America. He is disciplining us. He has let us have some losses, just like Israel had some losses because we've been so complacent, especially the church and all the evil that's been done in this country. Um, But at its heart, this country is not evil, and God is not done with it. He's just allowing us to get a spanking until our hearts are in the right place. And I believe 
for believers, most of us have our hearts in the right place, those of us who are awake and paying attention, are seeking him out, and we just need to wait on him. He's given me a lot of verses the last few days about waiting on him and resting in him, um, and his timing is always perfect. But he doesn't always give us the victory right away because he knows which victory will be best for us. So we just need to wait on him for the victory. Um, so the first time he had me um, in this, this chapter in Chronicles, Chronicles 20, um, the thing the Holy Spirit told me was that the military is going to do the work of putting Trump back in office. And I, some, I know some of you are like, oh, get over it already. Trump's not coming back in office. But yes, he is. That's what he's told his prophets and his people, and that's what's going to happen. But Trump isn't going to get himself there. It's going to be done with other means, and he's just going to come and pick up the crown. Um, so the Lord told me that about that. And also, the portion after it that the giants that we've been facing, um, all of these giants that have been trying to corrupt and oppress us and silence us and censor us are going to be taken down by Trump's administration and the people that come from it and even people in his family. Um, those giants are going to be destroyed. But he's still, he's, he's going to take care of the garbage in this country. He's going to be sorting us out and sorting out the garbage and cleaning out what he needs to clean out while he's giving us the victory. It's also going to be fast. He told me on the 12th that it will not be very long when it happens. Not that it won't be a long time from now, and I don't think it'll be a long time from now, but God hasn't given me a date. But that when it does happen, it will be in a day. It will just be done, like Isaiah 66. Um, yes. So, there's a number of other things that I've jotted down. I don't know if I'm going to share them right here. Today in particular, he revealed some amazing things in Ruth and um, also in Song of Solomon, which is always kind of an intimidating book to read. Um, it's just kind of hard to see how Jesus fits in there, but he does. To some, to some it's not. To me, it's always been kind of like, oh, I'll just skip that one. It's just kind of uncomfortable. Um, but he showed me some really incredible things, so I will go over those maybe right after I get done with this video. I'll just make another one. Um, yes. So I hope you guys have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening and that this blesses you. Um, I know it's blessed me and really helped me a lot, especially in view of myself because I'm always feeling like I've screwed up. You know, I had a bad thought or was grumpy today or whatever and that God is not going to speak to me or turn his back on me because I screwed up today and that's just not the case. He's not like that. He's long suffering. I mean think about all the wicked people that we know who are alive forever and you're like why are they still alive? It's because God is long suffering and he talks about this. So one more thing. Um, in Luke 18, it says, And God shall not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night, though he bears long with them. He's long-suffering, and he sits here with us while we're going through the length of the suffering with these evil people. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily, nevertheless. So when he is done suffering long, it's going to happen fast that he takes care of things. Um, but if he's long-suffering with the wicked... Why wouldn't he be long-suffering with us, with the people that are trying to pursue a life with him, the people who are seeking him out? Why would he not be long-suffering with us if he's so long-suffering with the wicked? Um, so just think about that. 